Um, welcome, uh, everyone. Thank you all very much for coming. Um, my name is James McDougall. I'm a fellow in history at Trinity College, which is the college that uh, hosts the Humanitas Visiting Professorship in Historiography. Uh, Humanitas, as all of you are probably aware, but I'm going to say it anyway, uh, is a series of visiting uh, professorships at Oxford and Cambridge, uh, run by the Weidenfeld Hoffman Foundation in partnership with Torch in Oxford and Crash at Cambridge. We've got the better acronym, you'll notice. Um, uh, and it's now in its fourth year, at least as far as historiography is concerned. Uh, in previous years, we've had Saul Friedlander talking about the history of the Holocaust, uh, Chris Bailey talking about empires, India and Islam, uh, Lynn Hunt talking about uh, dilemmas of history in a global age. And this year, we're delighted to have with us Professor Barbara Rosenwein, uh, Professor Emerita of History at Loyola University, Chicago, to address the theme of the history of emotions. Um, we're especially lucky this year in that not only do we have uh, Professor Rosenwein as our visiting professor, she's joined by another equally distinguished practitioner of emotions history, Professor Uta Frevert, the director of the Center for the History of Emotions at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development in Berlin. And Uta will be both responding to uh, Barbara's lecture this evening and giving a lecture of her own tomorrow evening to which Barbara will have a response. So we have a, a collaboration uh, uh, which is too unusual, I think, uh, between uh, a, a very distinguished medievalist in Professor Rosenwein and a distinguished uh, modern and contemporary historian in the case of Professor Fribert. Um, just so that uh, you all know and so also that you can pass on the news to your friends who may not have got into the building because it's so uh, full uh, tonight, uh, the lecture and all the other lectures in the series uh, will be uh, filmed and available uh, on podcasts through the Torch website. So if you uh, think of anyone after this evening's lecture who you uh, wish had been here, uh, you can please tell them about that, uh, and uh, we're also very keen to uh, expand the range of people who are reached by uh, the material uh, via the podcast and the website. The other series in the program uh, have already, in fact, uh, begun. Uh, Professor Rosenwein spent most of Friday uh, working with a number of our graduate students uh, in a series of masterclasses on uh, research design in uh, the history of motions. And tomorrow at 9.30 till 12.30 in the Torch Seminar Room in Radcliffe Humanities Building just next door, there will be a graduate research workshop uh, on uh, new research in the history of emotions, showcasing some work by our own uh, doctoral students and early career researchers, uh, at which both Professor Rosenwein and Professor Frivet uh, will be present to give feedback and thoughts. And that's uh, an open event and free to anyone who uh, uh, would like to come along. Professor Rosenman has also very kindly said that she is uh, happy to meet colleagues and students interested in work in this area. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to see her on Friday, and if you're not uh, among those presenting your work uh, tomorrow, please do uh, come up at the end of the lecture, get in touch, uh, let us know who you are, and uh, we'll try to arrange a meeting for you with Professor Rosenman before she leaves uh, later this week. There's some time later in the week uh, which she's made available to meet people who are interested in, in talking in, about work in this area. So please do make yourselves known uh, and... Uh, uh, avail yourself of the opportunity to, to speak to her. Um, Barbara Rosenwein uh, did her BA and PhD in Chicago. Indeed, she is a Chicagoan by birth and uh, has remained in Chicago, uh, unable to escape from the cold and the wind and the you know, um, wonderfulness of uh, the, uh, the Windy City. Um, she's been uh, at Loyola University in Chicago uh, since she finished her PhD in 1974, and she's now a Professor Emerita of History there. Uh, she's uh, an extremely distinguished uh, medievalist. She's been a visiting professor uh, at Erschersess and at Ernes in Paris, at Utrecht in the Netherlands, at Gothenburg in Sweden, as well, of course, as here. And her work has covered a variety of different areas. Her first work uh, on medieval charter literature uh, and on the social history of property uh, was To Be the Neighbour of St. Peter, on the social meaning of Cluny's property, on the Abbey of Cluny 
1989, described as breathing new life into what had previously been considered to be some of the driest, dustiest, and most overstudied uh, documents uh, of medieval history. She then moved on to thinking about space and immunities in early med medieval Europe uh, with the book Negotiating Space in 1999. She's written a number of uh, textbooks, <laughs> authored or co-authored uh, textbooks or, or general histories of the Middle Ages, including a short history of the Middle Ages, and co-authored uh, with Lynn Hunt, uh, our previous humanitas visiting professor, among others, The Making of the West. And more recently, she's become better known for her work in the history of the emotions, in particular editing the book Anger's Past, The Social Uses of an Emotion in the Middle Ages, which came out in 1998. Uh, a widely read and very influential article in the American Historical Review, worrying about emotions in history in 2002, and her groundbreaking book, Emotional Communities in the Early Mid uh, Middle Ages, published in uh, 2006. Uh, this evening, she's going to uh, address the first of her two topics for the Humanitas series uh, this, year, this year, talking about how can there be a history of emotions. Please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Barbara Rosenbaum. I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to be here in Oxford. It isn't my first time, but um, I am immersing myself in it in a way that I never was able to before, and it's a terrific, wonderful privilege. I want to thank, before I begin my talk, I want to thank James McDougall, uh, Sarah Bebb, uh, the Humanitas Program, the Weidenfeld Hoffmann Trust, the Blavatnik Family Foundation, Trinity College, which has put me up in a very nice room, and finally, all of you for coming. Thank you indeed. So the real question is, the emphasis is on history. How can there be a history of emotions? In today's scientific world, psychologists and neuropsychologists generally consider that human emotions are universal and hardwired. So, for example, fear in all its manifestations today as a facial grimace, uh, as a bodily reaction, flight as a product of specific brain systems or as a chemical process. All these possible uh, ways to define fear are, are nevertheless all considered to be the same now as they were in the past and will be in the future. Evolutionary psychologists lead a cosmity and John Toomey claimed that the human mind has not changed since the Stone Age. Our modern skulls house a Stone Age mind is their curt summary. Well, if we're the same as we were in the Stone Age, how can there be a history of emotions? I propose to explain today how it is possible and even to suggest how one might go about researching it. Although many scientists today do think that emotions are universal, biological, and invariable, this is not true of all. For example, some neuroscientists today <laughs> think that emotions are as much a product of top-down processing in which case they depend on cognitive work, which includes values and ideas and goals, um, as, as much top-down as bottom-up, in which case they are connected to precognitive, automatic, and biological responses. And that view suggests that socialization affects emotions because it helps determine what is and what is not relevant to one's goals and values, <coughs> both of which, as I said, are aspects of cognition. A new book on the psychological construction of emotion calls the brain a situated conceptualization generator I'll explain. <laughs> I think what they mean is that the brain 
uh, is situated. If it's in one kind of situation, it responds to that, but also it itself has been produced by upbringing, by parental uh, words and gestures, and so it conceptualizes as a generator of conceptualizations on the basis of what it's learned. It draws lines, for example, about what is an emotion, what isn't emotion, uh, uh, because it's influenced by all these external situations. And therefore, there is no God-given uh, notion of what an emotion is, but the brain conceptualizes. It also conceptualizes things that aren't emotions, like ideas and fantasies, and even the notion of idea and fantasy. So um, in that view, prior experiences determine the construction of emotions. On another front, a recent book by evolutionary biologist Marlene Zuck argues that changes in entire populations may take place in very short periods of time under the right circumstances. This is the psychological construction of emotion. I should have put that on for you. Edited by Barrett and Russell. And that's a very new book, just published this year. 2015, and then Marlene Zuck's book, Paleo Fantasy, where she says that it's a fantasy that the, uh, that, the, that the brain houses a Stone Age mind is the implication. It's a fantasy that anything we're dealing with today comes from the Paleolithic period because evolution can occur very, very quickly. And if this is true, the Stone Age mind disappears, and with it, its universal emotion. But what replaces that Stone Age mind? There is no consensus about what an emotion is. Many experimental and neuropsychologists cling to a series of photographed faces developed by the psychologist Paul Ekman and said to represent the expression of the six universal basic emotions, anger, disgust, fear, happiness, sadness, and surprise. And the reason I think why they cling to this series is because it makes their <laughs> job easier. You can measure responses to these phases. You can say that people with certain kinds of psychological disabilities don't properly recognize the anger of face. They don't process it correctly. You can measure that. You can morph these faces to be half angry, half sad, three quarters angry, three quarters sad, and then you see who can pick up on what. Um, and it, it is convenient for people who like to measure. But many researchers are unconvinced. Nico Frieda speaks of, quote, a domain of phenomena of feelings, behaviors, and bodily reactions for his definition of emotions. He cites movements and sounds that do not appear to serve instrumental purposes, but still function in communicating states of mind. You'll notice there's not a tear on any of these faces, yet all of us cry one time or another, and it communicates something about our emotional state. At least it communicates we are in an emotional state. Um, so Frida emphasizes the experiential nature of emotion, how we, how we feel and then express these emotions in more ways than just on the face. Um, that kind of experience is entirely lacking in Ekman's faces. Indeed, his faces are posed. 
No one is actually feeling the emotion. They just learn the musculature and how to control it. Ute Freivert and her team, and we're so lucky to have her here. Um, well, uh, Thomas Dixon. Well, well I'm, I'm going to get to Ute Freivert first. <laughs> Ute Freivert and her team have shown that notions about emotions, their location, their, you know, whether emotions are in the brain as we think today, or in the heart, or in the liver, or in the... Um, Never mind. Um, <laughs> um, uh, the location changes, the importance, the associations with gender, civility, and society, all these things have been in constant flux since the 18th century. And I can tell you, and any medievalist in here, and ancient historians can tell you, uh, if they're in here, that that's been true long before the 18th century, long before the Enlightenment. Uh, as for Thomas uh, Dixon, we'll go back to him, uh, he's shown that the very category of emotion is relatively recent, tracing the ways in which a great variety of so-called passions, so-called sentiments, were brought together under the umbrella term of emotions, basically by um, uh, 18th century uh, philosophers and then by white-coated physicians, more or less at the beginning of the 20th century. So here's what I assume. I assume that there is a biological and universal human aptitude for feeling and for expressing what we now call emotion. But what those emotions are, what they're called, how they're evaluated and felt, and how they're expressed or not, all of these are shaped, in my view, by what I call emotional communities. And so emotional communities is my focus of research. Emotional communities are groups, usually, but not always, social groups, that have their own particular values, modes of feeling, and ways to express those feelings. I liken emotional communities to speech communities, and here I've got a very primitive representation of a speech community. So the guys in red all speak the same, with the same accent, uh, the same inflection, with the same amount of passion, or more or less. And the guys in blue speak differently, a little bit differently. Um, some of the blue and some of the red intersect. Their accents are similar, um, but not exactly the same. Um, what I think about emotional communities is they may be very close in practice to other emotional communities of their time, or they may be quite unique and marginal. They're not bounded entities, and that's what I was trying to show in this sketch of speech communities. You can have them amorphously shading off into other emotional communities. They're not bounded. You, the researcher may define them quite broadly. You could define uh, an emotional community as the emotional community of Western civilization in the 13th century, mm, or rather narrowly, as I will do in my lecture on Wednesday if you come uh, to that. The advantage of a narrow uh, definition is that it allows the researcher to characterize in clearer, more precise fashion the emotional style of the group or more than one group in question. Larger, <coughs> larger communities will contain variants and counter styles. You might call them emotional subcommunities. Emotional communities are not always emotional. 
They simply share important norms concerning the emotions that they value and deplore and the modes of expressing them. So an emotional community will not necessarily express love and affection. In fact, they may generally express antagonism and hostility if that group values ambivalent, hostile, aggressive feelings in interpersonal relations. Any given society at any given period of time will likely contain more than one emotional community. Those of you who have come to Oxford from hometowns far away or from families that aren't exactly like your professors and the other students here will know what I mean when I say that there are more than one emotional community at one time, even though you can communicate with others and you can even move into other groups and feel fairly comfortable. Because emotional communities at any given time are rarely entirely separate. And sometimes they overlap in important and sometimes even essential ways. Let me give you an example. In the 15th century, in 15th century Europe, there were many emotional communities ranging from the dramatic and flamboyant, here I'm thinking of the court of Ducal Burgundy, to the quiet and restrained, here I'm thinking of an up-and-coming English gentry family. And yet, when a man from that quiet gentry family went to visit the court of Burgundy, he marveled at its goings on and he enjoyed his stay <coughs> there. And here you see uh, a miniature that stems from that court of Ducal Burgundy. Everyone is dressed in vibrant colors. Uh, there's an acrobat. Um, there are groups of people talking in lively fashion to one another. That I imagine, I don't have any iconography for our up-and-coming gentry family, that I imagine is a very different iconography if we did have a miniature from the gentry family. Because coexisting emotional communities must respond to the same or similar material, technological, and ideational con conditions, they are usually recognizably related to one another, whether as variants or as reactions within a wider cultural framework. So on Wednesday, I'll talk about two emotional communities in 17th century England, but I'll also note that they were not the only emotional communities during the same period of time. In general, the historian may, however, expect emotional communities from the same period and the same general culture to imitate, borrow from, or distance themselves from one another. When studying a community's emotions, what should the historian look for? Because emotions are inchoate, until they're given names, emotional vocabularies are exceptionally important for the ways in which people understand, express, and indeed feel their emotions. Consider that we often call music emotional, but when we ask, well, what emotion or emotions does it express? we find we must use words. Often they seem inadequate, to no matter how nuanced. Words can never quite compass music's <coughs> full emotional meaning. Neither do our emotion words. That's one of the reasons that the historian and anthropologist William Reddy created the notion of emotives which he defines as 
emotional expressions, a type, well, you can see what he defines it as. I will explain that in a minute. But what he's <coughs> trying to say in a nutshell is that emotional expressions are only drafts of our attempts to express our feelings. So what he says is a type of speech act different from both performative and constative utterances, okay? A constative utterance describes. This is a desk. That's a constative utterance. Uh, or that performs, that makes for changes like performatives. For example, I now pronounce you man and wife. Boy, does that change things, right? Mm -hmm. So, and he says it's different from both because it also, in addition to saying uh, this is anger, and in order, and also in in addition to saying I am angry to someone who then feels changed by that announcement. They also have an exploratory and self-altering <coughs> effect on the activated thought material of emotion, which I understand to mean that, and he hasn't corrected me yet, uh, <laughs> that uh, the emotive reacts back to the speaker who suddenly uh, thinks, redrafts, oh, wait a minute, I'm not really angry. I'm really hurt, for example. And that would be a way in which it would be exploratory and self-altering at the same time. Well, without question, emotions are made known also through tones of voice, gestures, grimaces, dancing, blanching, blushing, fainting, and bowing. The anthropologist Andrew Beatty notes that sometimes they take the form of illnesses. Breaking into song may be a sign of emotion, as may whispering and declaiming. Historians have evidence for some of this. In the Roman world, certain feelings were accompanied by gestures so typical and characteristic as to be essentially codified. Similarly, some gestures had well-known meanings in medieval visual sources. Here we see two of the many gestures of prayer. Written sources tell us about some of these gestures, describing laughing and weeping, for example, and such descriptions bring us back to words and the historian's métier of exploiting text. So words are mainly what the historical researcher must work with. And other researchers, too, even Ekman's faces <laughs> depend on particular words, happiness, sadness, and so on. Indeed, it makes sense that words are important, for emotions have communicative functions, whether with ourselves alone, saying, how am I feeling? I guess I'm feeling scared, or I guess I'm feeling happy, or I, and also with others, telling others how we feel. Because we understand our true feelings via these words, however inadequate they may be, we should not automatically distinguish expressed feelings from real emotions in any essential way. To be sure, as we interpret texts, or in real time, real life communications, we do want to look for that thing that's going on besides the words, as Al Pacino has said, of the actor's ideal. But we should also realize that although we naturalize our own emotions, thinking we know how we really feel, no matter what we say, in fact, we must interpret our own feelings according to our own emotional communities, norms, and vocabulary. However, some historians of emotions do accept a distinction between real and expressed emotions, preferring to speak of the performance of emotions. Gert Althoff is one such historian. 
He's interested in the political messages that are communicated by emotions performed by kings and other leaders. But performed emotions are also felt. This was already the conclusion of Arlie Hochschild's 1983 study of the emotional training of airline flight attendants. The successful trainees internalized the emotional norms they were told to perform. They learned to really mean the smiles that they gave to rowdy passengers. They learned to suppress feelings of fatigue and irritation. Of course it's true that sometimes people feign their feelings. And this is something that the historian, like the psychiatrist, needs to be alert to. The feigning itself tells us what the emotional norms must be. But what interests me even more than whether this or that particular emotion expressed by this or that particular person is pretense. What I'm really more interested in is to know how sensitive particular emotional communities are to issues of sincerity. Because worrying about true intent are, uh, worries about true intent are themselves historically contingent. We happen to live in an era that really cares about whether people really mean what they're <laughs> saying. But uh, this is our time, and we should inquire why are we so interested. If I'm right about the importance of words, it means that histories of emotion <coughs> must pay systematic attention to vocabularies, comparing these across emotional communities, whether those communities coexist at the same time <coughs> or follow one another in sequence, shows, among other things, that notions of what is emotional have changed over time. This point is rarely recognized. But if I take Ekman's list of basic emotions, I find that those words, or their equivalents in other languages, have not always been considered emotions. Consider disgust, for example. He's got a nice facial expression for disgust. And he says it's a basic emotion. But the first time that I find it mentioned as an emotion, that is, as a passion, is in a 15th century treatise by the theologian Jean Gerson. To be sure, he called it a passion and not an emotion. But let's, let's just be... Uh, um, let's agree that those two words more or less describe the same uh, semantic field. Nevertheless, we see a great difference between Ekman's disgust and Gerson's. Even if the facial expression for Gerson's disgust looked exactly like Ekman's, which I really doubt. For what you feel when you have a, this is Ekman's face. Uh, uh, okay, so that, that's, that's a, a disgust when you find a fly in your soup, right? But for Gerson, there's so many forms of disgust. There's a fastidium bonum, a good disgust, which is a sense of righteousness. Or there is a nausea voluptatis male, not a nausea when you look at your soup, but a nausea, which we would call really a sense of guilt, when you know that um, you've got you've got a bad um, um, uh, desire, um, pleasure, and yet words alone however important, cannot tell us all that much about emotional life unless we know which words emotional communities emphasize. 
and how and why they did so. For example, although Ekman treats surprise as a basic emotion, I think few of us, maybe some of us, would say that we emphasize surprise in our daily lives. I'd venture to say that we emphasize happiness much more than surprise. Even the United Nations is interested in happiness. Its World Happiness Report ranked Denmark the happiest nation on earth in 2014. Researchers at the University of Warwick reportedly found that, quote, Danes were less likely to possess a short version of the gene linked to low levels of life satisfaction, end quote. <laughs> I have to admit that I have not followed out this research, and one reason I have not done so is that happiness, while so important apparently to the United Nations and the University of Warwick, and perhaps to Danes, was generally <laughs> frowned upon for a very long time in Western history. Alcuin, a late 8th century, early 9th century intellectual, was very wary of it. He spoke of pride spawning heresies, bitterness, and laughter overflowing from happiness. Well, he used the word laetitia. He didn't say happiness, but that's English. Um, he also said that Laetitia was the child of gluttony. The only time he spoke well of it was when he paired it with spiritualis. You can conquer sadness, he said, through spiritual happiness, hope in future things, the consolation of the Bible, and the spiritual cheerfulness of fraternal conversation. This sort of happiness must feel very different from the one that the Danes are supposed to feel most of the time. <laughs> Lastly, emotions are embedded in what I call emotional sequences. Now, psychologists frequently speak of emotion scripts, by which they mean the circumstances that give rise to one emotion and the actions and <coughs> expressions that accompany that emotion. A typical example is an anger script, okay? A person is offended. He or she, let's say she, just for fun, scowls at the offender. She feels internal tension. She desires retribution. And the fifth element of the sequence, she strikes out and harms the offender. This is not what I mean by an emotional sequence. I mean that emotions do not normally come in singletons. Rather, they often consist in a variety of emotions and emotional gestures, one after another. So, for example, in the 17th century, numerous English Puritan spiritual testimonials repeated a common narrative that went from feelings of sinfulness to despair, to dread of damnation, finally to the feeling of comfort and joy associated with the assurance of God's love. Why are sequences important? Because they tell us how emotions are felt differently according to the company they speak, uh, company they keep. If the Puritans had felt feelings of sinfulness that then led them to a devil may care and let's just go out and get drunk, that would have had to feel very different from a sense of sinfulness that led to despair. The sequence reveals how an emotion is valued and felt. Explicit statements do so as well. When the 12th century abbot Eilred of Rivaux says that curiosity 
is desire of the eyes and a very, very bad emotion indeed, then his feeling when he felt curious must have been very different from 17th century philosopher Thomas Hobbes's feeling of curiosity, since Hobbes thought very highly of curiosity. All of the points that I've made so far depend on words in text, consciously shaped, written sources. Am I therefore dealing simply with rhetoric rather than with feeling? No. <laughs> you can't separate feeling from rhetoric, which is crucial for emotional expression. Put another way, emotional expression is always rhetorical to some degree. We don't speak emotion words alone. We embed them in constructed sentences. We don't just say anger. We say, I'm angry at him. That's the beginning of a speech. And we may well go on to say, I'm angry at him because he insulted me. And because you're my friend, I hope you'll join me in feeling angry at him. Now that's rhetoric. It's a statement designed to persuade. Small wonder that Aristotle embedded a long discussion of emotions in his book on rhetoric. Nor should we dismiss the emotions that we find in texts as belonging to the boilerplate of particular genres and therefore meaningless from the point of view of real feeling. Formal modern letters begin with dear, as in dear sir. No one imagines that the sir is really dear, huh? <laughs> yet desiccated as that emotion is, it nevertheless has a very different impact from the high that is the favorite opening of emails. Hi is cooler, it's breezier. I say boilerplate has significance. It's used by different groups differently. I myself still use dear in email. Um, and it can change over time. As a researcher of emotions, I actually welcome con uh, commonplaces because they tell me precisely how people think they and <coughs> others feel, or at least should feel. All of these things, words, emphases, sequences, rhetoric, boilerplate, all of them constitute the emotional inheritances that are available to contemporaries living at the same time and to new generations that come thereafter. Emotional communities adapt the inheritances to their own needs. Sometimes they produce new words and new sequences built on the older ones. And brand new traditions may be introduced. Immigrants have always offered potent new norms wherever they settle, and today mass media, such as movies and TV, do similar work in places where they were not created, but where they are shown and dubbed. Recent scientific studies in the field of genetics suggest a metaphor for the variety, latency, and potential um, uh, as well as the interaction of emotional communities within any given society. While it's true that individual genes are unlikely to change quickly over time, although so sometimes they do, nevertheless, they express themselves differently depending on their environment. These epigenetic changes, scholars note, are rapid and rampant. Further, even one person 
carries not one genome, but several. This is known as gene mosaicism. It means that while some genomes may express themselves at certain times, others remain latent but potent. At the same time, because they're part of the same body, they must interact. And now I'm going to conclude. I hope I've made a case for the history of emotions. Indeed, I hope I've made a case for many histories of emotions. I've suggested one way to go about it by analyzing the emotional repertory, emphases, and sequences of emotions in emotional communities. If you come back on Wednesday, you'll hear about two of these in 17th century <coughs> England. There are other methods and approaches I haven't had a chance to describe in much detail today, but I have suggested that some historians look at emotions as performances and others as emotives. And these suggest two other avenues of research, at least. Whatever approach you choose, there's much exciting work to be done. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Barbara, for giving us this extremely insightful, self-revelatory. Mm -hmm. Dear, I can actually um, confirm that she always <laughs> addresses people by email with dear and not using the hi, and I appreciate it very much. Um, um, lecture that also uh, kind of spanned the wide kind of gaps between research that is done now in psychology and not just psychology but um, more and more is actually done in neurosciences and what anthropologists and sociologists and historians are interested. You gave us a whole range and I can only admire you for this very bold and generous overview that you gave us. I could also um, not but agree with you know, your main points, um, the point that, of course, emotions do have a history, although it's still kind of, uh, I'm working at an institute uh, that is mainly staffed by psychologists, so three-thirds of us are psychologists, and I'm the only, hist my group is the only kind of historian group, and what we often, very often encounter as a kind of suggestion from their side is, well, of course, um, the circumstances under which people experience and express feelings differ over history or throughout history. That's been taken for granted. But the feeling as such, you know, how it feels to feel pain or pleasure, um, fear or anger, um, happiness or love or surprise or nausea, a disgust, that's supposed to be hardwired. That's part of you know, our chemical, biological uh, setup. And my uh, general <laughs> kind of answer to that is, how do you know? You know? Um, and again, but then also kind of asking myself, how do I know? Because I also kind of, I don't have an immediate access as you have. Um, to people who've been living in the Middle Ages or in ancient China or Greece or even in the 19th century. We can rely on words, as you say, but we don't have an immediate, we don't have the kind of access that the neuroscientists pretend to have by having a kind of direct um, uh, image of what happens in the brain when people, again, vocabulary matters here, say that they're experiencing pain. But that's uh, kind of leave, let's leave that aside. We agree on the basic point that mm, historian, uh, that uh, emotions do have a history. I also agree with your what you what you kind of uh, said is your basic assumption. I couldn't agree more that um, there is probably a a, uh, a kind of 
basic aptitude in all humans to feel, to experience feelings, to have feelings, to experience feelings. So to kind of um, mm, allow certain biological chemical processes to arise and to, um, to kind of retreat in certain situations. Um, so emotions are in a way rooted in biology as everything is basically. But what is really interesting, I mean, what, what it makes historians tick and what makes historians happy is then to find out how this basic human aptitude is being played out and how it changes. And that's where we are when you talk about, um, about the emotional repertoires, about emotional communities that are a basic kind of container of these processes and that shape these processes. What I also kind of agree and I'm puzzled actually by uh, the fact that even that science or that discipline that has been most prominent in and, and actually um, been the first to, to um, uh, take care, to be interested in emotions, uh, psychology, kind of explorator or, or, or ex no, how do you say that, empirical, um, uh, evidence-based psychology, that ha they haven't managed to come up with a generally approved and consented definition of emotions <coughs> and um, that's also one of my weapons when I talk to my <laughs> colleagues and say, you want to tell me what an emotion is come on you, you completely disagree among yourselves but um, and also kind of historically there is no clear-cut decision and uh, or clear-cut clear, clear definition or decision on how to define emotions um, but you know very different words and the the affects the passions the, the sentiments the the uh, appetites, the drives that populate kind of 18th century um, <coughs> lexicons and, 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 and uh, encyclopedia. And of course, I agree, you know, point taken, that uh, these words, these concepts have a far longer history uh, uh, in, into uh, ancient history and medieval history, of course. Mm. It's a whole world of difference that is built into the vocabulary, into the kind of meta vocabulary of emotions, which all already alert us. I mean, these our our ancestors have been dumb, you know. They must have something in mind when they try to to distinguish between certain states uh, of, you know, emotional arousal or emotional um, you know, expression that they want to kind of say, well, this is a passion and that's an affect and that's a sentiment and that's an appetite and that's all very different things. And sometimes I think that by then using the, the uh, kind of uh, general term of emotions that have, has, beca has um, become fashionable then throughout the 20th century, especially in Anglo-Saxon psychology and then moving into uh, other um, speech communities, there we've lost something. We've lost something that uh, with, with the very kind of, um, prominent and with very uh, consciously approved of or, or claimed by our, um, by our ancestors. But one thing strikes me as, you know, when, when I go back to old-fashioned vocabulary or to, to uh, more recent theories of emotion, coming from, from psychology or neuroscience, one thing strikes me as being a kind of common denominator, and that's the, um, the importance of the body. So the body is always involved uh, when we talk about passions, affects, and emotions. And it's not involved if we talk, whenever we talk about cognitive processes that we still try to distinguish from emotion. So Sometimes, you know, when we kind of broaden the category very widely, people start to be get anxious and say, "Well, actually, you know, what? Uh, how? How do you kind of? If if we talk about cognition now, that's something that that um, um, not well already took it, but picked it up, but picked up on it, but other people kind of invented. So, what's actually, you know, is there no difference between cognitive <coughs> and emotional process anymore? And at that point, I would always say there is a difference." And that's about the involvement of the body. And th that's where my first question actually to you comes up. Um, I was struck in a way by your insistence and the, the, uh, the emphasis that you put 
on words, on vocabulary, on and I fully again fully agree that words matter because words you know label they kind of they, they function as emotives in, in ready sense. Um, they allow us to distinguish between certain states of feelings that might, you know, might not be as as um, <coughs> immediately uh, observed and, and distinguished when we feel them. But once we name them, once we use a word, we know how we feel, or we know that this is not quite the right word, so we look for another one. But for um, for medievalists but in particular but also for modern for uh, for all of us emotion um, or the, the body is is uh, important in that it it's not only it's not just being captured by words but and you mentioned that but most most of all by by gestures by mimics by the way we use our muscles the way we um, you know if we kind of uh, stand upright or rather kind of hunch our, sh our shoulders the way we you, you showed us these beautiful pictures of different forms of or different gestures of prayer that also kind of by by kneeling down for example you have another your body feels differently uh, from when you stand upright so the body really matters and I just that's my kind of first concern or my first question how do you actually um, integrate the body into your research by for example using paintings using images using sculpture that has has been s and, and also kind of has been of such high value in um, in uh, uh, periods of time where we where people were not yet flooded with images like we are today but that were an image of a bent uh, kind of body had a very kind of particular meaning and was could be immediately <coughs> read as expressing a certain state of mind. So, do you integrate? It? How do you integrate it? Do you still need words, or do do, do the does the body speak to you as a medievalist? That would be my first question. And the second question is about again the emotional communities, and I've been struggling with, with that concept uh, ever ever since I read your your great books um, and, and articles. Um, it's on the one hand, it's a very, very powerful concept. We can immediately relate to it. On the other hand, I see a number of problems, and I would like maybe you could discuss them here or tomorrow or um, whenever. Um, first, but that might be a very German predicament. The uh, the 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 notion of community immediately kind of asks or invites the other of community, meaning society. So in the German tradition of the of kind of 20th century sociology and social philosophy, the, um, uh, with very kind of strong repercussions then in politics, um, community is you know, the, the kind of the nice little stuff that we enjoy so much, which is by definition emotional, which is close, which is about emotional bonding, which is about we understand each other. We are very kind of narrowly, def de narrowly defined our frontiers, our limits, our borders, and then we have a great time together. While out there, there is society, and society is you know, this big thing that is kind of governed by certain structures, by certain processes that we can't control, that we don't have a, a, a kind of deep knowledge of, and that is kind of alien, that is cold, that is, you know, that kind of discussion is immediately evoked when I hear people talk about communities. And I wonder if, <coughs> if that's, again, only a German predicament, and if Anglo-Saxon speakers don't have that, don't carry that baggage, and that's, that, that could be easily dismissed then. But um, on, a, on a kind of a second uh, level, I would also kind of ask, um, no question, but ask um, to what degree emotional co communities are actually mm, analytically different from you know, social groups, religious entities, political uh, um, groups um, or associations. Are these, by definition, is every group that we encounter, be it religiously defined, be it socially, be it economically defined, is that per se an emotional community? And if so, then what 
is actually the analytical or the foundational stance of emotions here. Um, maybe that's too abstract. Um, if I define a group by its kind of economic position, then the economic position determines, or partly deter or kind of not partly, greatly determines what this group is about. So if it's if uh, it's kind of if workers or capitalists mm -hmm. are um, kind of described as a social group or a social class in 19th century Europe then uh, the economic situation defined is, is of foundational value. If I talk about religious groups, then it's belonging to a certain um, conf oh, can I say that? confession or a certain religious uh, um, brand, so the, the Catholics uh, as to the Protestants or the Muslims or the Jews or whatever. Um, but again, religion <coughs> confounds the group. Now, when you talk about emotional communities, I wonder if it's actually emotions that found this group or this community, and or <laughs> or uh, if emotions come out of group processes that are defined otherwise, that are defined by belonging to a certain religious or value system or what what or what not. So what's the found, is there a foundational value of emotions in these emotional communities, or is it just the kind of the, the consequence of being uh, in a community or group structure that then breeds certain emotions that are then played out? And that's, that would kind of give um, a very different um, kind of epistemological status to the notion of emotional community, and that's something that probably I haven't quite um, understood. And of course, you know, um, coming back to your uh, uh, the, the little kind of story about how you like to, to call people dear, are you then belonging to an emotional community? Uh, you know, the two of us would then belong to that, but <laughs> where are they kind of, how small and, or where the defining, you know, what's, what's defined, what's the, what's the defining feature of, a, of an emotional community rather than others? Um, as a modern historian, I personally kind of have warmed up more to the notion or the, to, the, to the concept of looking at or to an approach that looks at institutions. And that might be, uh, again, a predicament of somebody who works in the, on the 18th, 19th, 20th centuries uh, rather than on medieval um, society where probably maybe institutions are not of that kind of defining value. Um, but looking at, say, institutions like the family, the military, the state, um, the welfare system, um, also kind of churches, religious congregations, um, make me kind of aware that each of these institutions are actually breeding a certain um, emotional repertoire, a certain emotional vocabulary, a certain emotional way of, or a certain way of showing expressing or maybe also kind of uh, um, um, this um, um, uh, oh goodness, uh, of, of, of neglecting emotions or not having them shown. So this, what could you kind of, could you, um, what, 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 does that make sense to you or, or rather not? And then, um, and, then uh, and institutions also kind of allow me to have a more and, and as historians, we of course always interested in, you know, change. You know, what what actually changes over time. And um, when I look at institutions, institutions change, or well, they change in themselves, but they also kind of change their status in a society. So some institutions are more important in kind of early nineteenth century uh, society, European societies, uh, while other institutions are more important now in our lives. And the, the, uh, the, the kind of the, the relative valence, the relative importance of institutions then can also explain why our societies today are probably as societies emotionally different or, or privilege other emotional styles than kind of the, the late 18th century or the, the kind of mid 19th century. Um, I kind of, I stop here um, <laughs> and I hope we have uh, the opportunity to talk about that, but also kind of involve all of you in, in kind of asking questions. And I would be very happy actually to uh, give 
more room to Barbara, who is our main speaker anyway today, because my voice is pretty much fading, and I uh, hope it I get it back tomorrow. <laughs> Shortly. Sure. So first of all, Bob was going to respond to a few of Uta's points uh, while you all think and cogitate and, and, uh, and distill questions from both speakers. Uh, and then we'll open the floor to questions. We have another 40 minutes or so still, uh, quite comfortably, before we need to, to leave. Um, so plenty of time for uh, open general discussion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Uta. Very, uh, very nice... Um, uh, set of nice things and also very nice set of questions, which I really appreciate because I think um, we, uh, we really have to um, come to terms with um, emotional communities. That's the biggest issue. I just want to say uh, one small thing about the hardwire business and one small thing about the body. Uh, the, the small thing about the hardwire business is that the wires uh, are not, uh, the, the wires are there, definitely, but the, even neuroscientists are beginning to realize that the wiring isn't the same at all times. That the wiring itself is um, changed, transformed by uh, experiences, by upbringing, by the child in the womb, by the child uh, and as the, uh, uh, the child listens to um, the mother and the father and the sister and the brother talking to it, that that shapes the wire ring, even though the wires are, are built in. So um, that's particularly <coughs> emphasized in the book uh, that I mentioned uh, by uh, edited by uh, Feldman <coughs> Barrett and Russell called the psychological construction of emotion. And that really gives some ammunition to those of us who think that the hard wire, um, uh, the, the, the hard wire argument has been too often uh, e evoked. Um, and about the body, yes, the body is very important, but I, I think that it's important for us, at least for me, to realize that the body is not, in fact, one thing. That, too, changes. The conception of the body changes over time, so that there isn't the body, but there are notions of the body, and there may be, this is Western thinking, there may be cultures where uh, the m body, emotion, uh, mind distinction just doesn't fly at all. Um, I wouldn't be surprised because I don't think that the body is the same thing as what Shylock demanded a pound of. Um, the body is, is, so the body is involved in emotional expression um, in my view uh, in different emotional communities, uh, in different uh, orders of magnitude, and in different ways. So now I come to, what is an emotional community? I do not mean for emotional community to be reified. I do not mean for emotional community to be anything other than a heuristic device, a tool for the historian who wants to be thinking about emotions, who finds a welter of sources, goodness knows, and who wonders, how do I um, organize this to make some sense? Is it just <coughs> emotions, emotions, emotions all over the place, all kinds of different emotions? I see emphasis here, emphasis there. And I suggest thinking about people living in group. And, well, for me, Gemeinschaft, Gesellschaft, that, that dichotomy 
uh, does not uh, really set off echoes in my psyche. And I, I, maybe I'm alone, maybe it's an uh, American uh, ver version of it. A, mo uh, a community, like a speech community, doesn't necessarily mean that these people like each other, that they're close together, or they, they may be a very hostile speech community, but they say the same sorts of things in the same sort of way. Uh, and um, I think that the uh, that that it's just important to realize that this is meant to be a flexible term that can refer to a whole society if that's what you want to look like. But remember that if that's what you want to look at, then you're going to have to figure out a way to 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 to, to, to wrestle it uh, because you you have too many sources, you've got too much vocabulary. Um, so I, I think, I mean, I made some generalizations about our society. I said we're more interested in happiness than we are in surprise. That's talking about a whole society as an emotional community, our modern, Western, European, Anglo-European uh, uh, society is very, very concerned with, puts a tremendous amount of emphasis on happiness, and I was trying to make the point that that's not always been the case, that that's changed over time. So I do see it possible for the researcher to take society as his or her uh, topic and treat it as an emotional community with certain norms, with certain uh, <coughs> uh, emphases. But I don't really recommend it. I'm more, I'm more comfortable with uh, the sub-communities. I'm more comfortable with the fragmentations. And that's where I would like to come to um, uh, the institutions versus the emotional communities. If I were to look at the institution of the military or the institution of the family, I would have the tendency to want to break it down. OK, military. But are the, uh, uh, the, the grunts uh, who are at the front line, uh, do they express their emotions, the same emotions? Uh, are they interested in the same emotions as the, um, the commanding officers? Or do we have a couple of different or maybe many different military communities? Do we have different military communities, let's say, on the frontier than we do uh, internally? Um, uh, I think um, uh, I, I, I would tend to see fragmentation. My, um, my own uh, methodology and approach leads me to look for um, uh, multiplicity rather than uniformity. But that's my bias, and it probably does come from being a medievalist. Uh, from from my initial training. Um, however, I don't deny the absolute validity of considering, let's say, um, the state as an emotional community, people in power who are attempting to, I think you said, breed uh, emotions within uh, the general public. <coughs> I, I agree that that is often what state not only modern states, but medieval states try to do. But then again, my tendency, my assumption always is there are going to be people who there are going to be people who disagree. There are going to be people who cultivate different emotions. There are going to be dissenters. There are going to be in the medieval church. There are going to be Cathars, that, or if Cathars didn't exist, which is possible, there are going to be uh, um, uh, uh, heretics. Uh, no, they didn't exist either. Well, never mind. There are going to be people who do not adopt the, 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 uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the party line. And we have seen this. I mean, you can see this in Stalin's Russia. Some work has been done on that. Um, it's just uh, no state can, can absolutely determine. Just as the training of those airline hosts and hostesses 
um, I said that the managed heart, these people were trained to smile through the worst kind of behavior, uh, but there were others who just couldn't get trained. And they were either fired or they quit. And I'm interested in those too. I'm interested in the quitters, the people who say, I'm not part of this. I'm, I, I don't belong. So uh, that's a very quick answer to your question. But anyway, I, 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 I refused to give a definition of an emotional community because it isn't meant to be uh, at all a bounded entity. It is meant to be a Procrustean bed. It's just a tool. Use it if you find it useful. Don't use it if you don't. Um, <laughs> now, epistemological state. Uh, so it's not an epistemological uh, uh, concept. It's just a tool. Um, but when you ask, uh, does the emotional community produce the emotion, or do the emotions produce the emotional community, I'd say it's a chicken or egg situation, and that there is no, uh, the generation goes both ways. The, uh, the individual who's part of an emotional community may very well help that community generate certain kinds of emotions, but then the community also uh, is an emotional generator. Uh, that, um, that changes individuals. So I don't think that there's uh, any one, uh, I can't give you an answer to that, and I, I really wouldn't, wouldn't want to, to say. Um, so, um, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>